Welcome to Continuous Dream. Today, Part 4, Chapters 5, 6, and 7 of Kells, The Gospel of Columba, a novel by Amy Kreider. Part 4, read by Jeff Breitman, Baird Brucher, and Lindsay Summers. Part 4, Chapter 5, The Desert Nothing alive within sight. Not a wall or a man-made thing. Una almost changed her mind, but could not retrace her steps. There was some relief in not having the choice. Surely she would find her way. God would not allow her never to see Deirdre again. Thoughts dried up in the simmering heat. God would take care. Take care of what? Everything. How can it still be green at home? Green and wet. Dermot slipping on the mossy bank. Slipping now in the sinking sand. The sun so far from the grey, misty fields. The sun is here, where it hides like the Lord's ways. Here it shouts. Sound swallowed by immense skies. There must be a sign. It can't be hidden. A sign in the sun. There must be a path. It's here, only buried. Here the flesh never rots, but only hardens on the bone, red and tough. Cowhide. Slaughter. Dermot tying the rope. Knochtok slit in the throat. Flay in the hide. Careful not to tear. Slipping in blood. Mud. Dung. Moist moss. Wet walls. Mossy stones. Magic wells. Lovely water. Juicy fruits. Berries. Cherries. Stones. Pits. Wells. Flooding streams. Dams. Signs of man. Dark houses. Shadows. Shade. The moon rising over the wooden cross, bright as my daughter's face. Her face bright as a starry night. Her voice like a summer breeze through the leaves. Will she remember my voice? In this silent sky, swallowing sound. Sandy steps, shuffling sandals, a soft scrape gone without an echo. No reply. No bird. No cry. No choice. No choice. Fist by my sides. Bleeding blisters, knives of sand. Night. When did the sun set? Breathless cold, no dew, no ice. The stream cracking under my knuckles. Still runs. The stream bubbling under ice along the frosted bank. Sun. When did the sun rise? When did I start walking? How did I rise? No choice like the stream running like a thief, like a horse ridden at midsummer games. The boys parade. Riding like a thin, dead in the sea, split throat, blood and salt. Waves of froth, waves of dry froth slipping underfoot. Pebbles in the well, wishing for a new chance. For Deirdre. For Deirdre. Wishing for grace. Willing the Blessed Virgin. Willing an answer. Willing to go on. Willing every hard, hand-wrought labor. Willing without choice. Her sight gone. Swept away. And lost like a gem fallen from a ring. Find me in Deirdre's golden garden. Night. When did the sun set? Am I asleep? God Almighty, let me wake in linen sheets, bandages on my feet, a voice singing, Deirdre's voice. Birds trilling in the dawn, 
sunrise in the mist, glistening dew, a moist rag to my lips, words dry up. Day. When did day break? What will they find? Dry, leather-wrapped bones. Christ in the hot sun, vinegar for wine, blood for milk. I am the way and the resurrection. I am not ready. I am not ready, but... Someone knelt beside Una where she lay in the sand. He put her ear to Una's lips, and a croak bubbled out that sounded like, My choice. Always. My choice. Una awoke in a cart that bounced hard over the rocky track. Her legs were shackled. Her head throbbed. Her tongue was swollen in her dry mouth. There was a bolt of linen under her head, her one comfort. Around her were casks and amaphorae and bolts of cloth and a cage with a bright blue singing bird. She looked at the bird and parted her lips. The bird's round eye glared at her. Then with a little wing flap, it turned away. With pain, Una sat up as far as she could, her face even with the cage. She tried to say, birdie, birdie, but could only manage, burba. The cart stopped under a sudden clump of trees at an oasis. Voices crackled. She couldn't sit up far enough to see the men. She lay back. A boy jumped on the cart and slid his arm under her head and put a cup of water to her lips. She choked and he pulled it away. She grunted to beg for it. He brought it back to her lips, and she held her mouth in the water without swallowing, sucking slightly. He sat with her a while in this position, until she could swallow the whole cup. A voice of rebuke rose, and the boy jumped off the cart again. They spent the afternoon there, and at sunset she was given another cup of water. Sometime in the middle of the night, they continued on their journey, and in the morning they passed fields of wheat and vines and the great round walls of Baghdad. Una revived and sat up. She looked in the street eagerly for her daughter's blue eyes. They came to the palace, to the trader's gate. The boy jumped on the cart and unloaded the bundles and jars. They were careful with the bird, but as for Una, they yanked her up and dumped her onto the ground, her knees buckling. Her legs were shaking as she tried to stand, stabbing pain in her raw feet. She sank to the ground and sat with her knees drawn up to her chest while the trading business buzzed around her. She seemed forgotten as wares were inspected and lists consulted. The camels and cart left the courtyard and she sat in her shackles, breathing hard. She closed her eyes. A breeze stirred and she slumped over her knees. A familiar voice woke her. So you have shamed us? She looked up at Rosa. You were given your freedom and you return as a slave. So you shame Haran who freed you. So you choose to be a slave and a slave you shall be under my charge. No one will know you here. Don't ask about your daughter. So beautiful and precious, so special, no? The special singing bird is away in her little palace. Some of us are not so lucky. You are lucky to be alive. You should be grateful every day for me to keep you alive, that's right. You won't deserve the bread you'll eat, but I am a good person, better than you. Come, I am a good person. I'll give you a day to heal yourself before you work. Come. Una stared, unable to move, and Rosa pulled her up by her hair.
Part Four, Chapter Six. Scribing interrupted. Lay out a large square. Bisect into four squares. Above and below that, the measure of half a square lengthens it into a rectangle. The upper curve of the K would go above the square. The tail of the K below. Everything based on a square or a circle. There is no ruler. Only the compass for measure. Long invisible lines from corner to corner, from midpoint to midpoint, define the center of ornamental circles. Midpoint to corner defines the diamond center, where the curve of the K goes into its stem. The correspondence is all invisible. Like the working of God, it must be perfection. This measurement, these perfect squares and circles. The price was blood, the sacrifice of everything we had in the world. The sacrifice of the monks who died at Lindisfarne. The lives we all gave up for this, for. What it represents, the sacrifice of over a hundred innocent calves, the pages curling, trying to become hides again, the skin around warm bodies, the memory of its life bending this page, the sacrifice of farms, of sisters and mothers, the loss of status and power. The martyrdom of separation. Gone. Gone the green gold fields of oat and rye. Gone the feasts and the singing of ballads. Now, it is penance and psalms. Solace in the church, the chant of God's word, the slow hush of voices sharing prayer. Wanting nothing. Where are our sisters? Where are the women we might have loved? Abandoned. Kings ask us to pray for them, for their souls, for justice, for prosperity. Kings may demand, but our sisters only said. Go, if you will be happy. Go. She said, "Now, you will be happy." As if a lamb on the altar said it to the knife coming down. Sacrificed. For the blood, this must be perfect. The tip of the pen, crisp and clean. The vellum unblemished and white, the curves as round as the sun, colors blazing like saints that come to us in dreams. They speak with our sisters' voices. They sing soothing words, ghosts or angels. The past beckons, and we sacrifice the past and the future. For this age, the last age, to prepare for Christ's return, for all humanity, we pray, for the sake of the soft, earthy world. Every day, every single day, every three hours, year in and year out, we offer this gift, born of sacrifice. As any gift must be, for the living and the dead, the ghosts of the past and the angels in our dreams, this must be perfect. All thought is gone; there are only squares and circles. Perfect concentration.
the world fallen away for the sake of the world. A shaft of light falls across the page, the pathway to God. Kanachtoch laid his straight edge across the page from the lower right, the midpoint of the square, to the upper left, and marked the diamond center, where the K crossed from curve to stem. He had been laboring all morning in silence, when a smell of drying and rotting fish crept into the room. He felt the hairs on his arms prick. He put down the pen and looked around. Monks were studying their books, bent over in the dim light. Their hands gleamed, some tracing the words with their fingers. The stillness was palpable, and the moment frozen in time. He hurried outside and into the moment that the roar erupted. A storm of voices from the beach, and he ran down the road of the dead until he could see, and he stopped. Six long boats, boats the like he had never seen, enormous, enough to hold thirty giant men, stinking of fish strung to dry between the mast and the side, painted bright red and white and yellow, heaved onto the beach. Was he the only one who saw? Was this a dream? A nightmare? Wasn't he really inside, still staring at his page? But... Monks sprang beside him. The church bell rang like a crow's warning cry. Some brothers ran toward the beach, others away. Kayla ran straight to him. The book! We need the book! He shouted and ran into the house. Part 4. Chapter 7. The Slave Rosa, who was sharp and learned the language quickest and well, and whose confidence, height, and powerful will raised her up over the other slaves in the kitchen, ruled over them with a regal air, though she did work alongside them as hard as anyone or harder. Her word was an order not to be disobeyed. Most of them, like Rosa, were from a pagan land, though they all converted to the heathen religion at Rosa's insistence. She told them Una was evil and that she worshipped the son of a prostitute. She made it clear no one was to talk to Una. Sometimes she said to Una, You are the luckiest of women that I saved you and give you bread to eat. And your squeaking mouse of a daughter, she is the luckiest little princess. Yes, everyone loves her because she is a witch and she has cast a spell on everyone. And in the back of Una's mind, she heard the cry, Natalia! Natalia! Though Rosa never spoke of her dead daughter. As Una scrubbed the mosaic floor, she studied the complex pattern of twining leaves. If she were not a house slave, she would like to be someone who made these tiles. In Dermot's Psalter, there were a few pages with borders like this. Was Dermot reading the Psalter now and praying for her? She tried to remember his voice, reading aloud, but in her mind his voice was altered by the accents around her now. She was in the hall outside one of the men's sitting rooms, their voices within like the scrape of metal on stone. But one voice was gentle, making even their rough, hard language sound like softly pelting rain. It sounded like Dermot. She hadn't realized that before. This was Musa. She strained to listen, kneeling on the wet tiles, squeezing the rag in her fist. "'What about Deirdre?' a man's voice said. The rag slipped away, the breath froze in her chest. She was sure she had heard it. What about her? 
What about her? There was a jumble of voices rising excitedly, the words colliding. Let him speak. His gentle voice floated below the others, murmuring like a stream. Something about a feast. Something about a namesake. Something about a baby. A sudden tap on her shoulder sent her forward onto her hands. Ali stepped around her. Go to the kitchen. You shouldn't be here this time of day. She gazed up at him, unable to speak for a moment. Thinking quickly, Shall I take stock of the kitchen supplies for Musa's feast? Yes, of course. When is it? When the baby is born? Yes, next month. He began to step away, then caught himself, realizing what he had given away. He had kept Rosa's secret to please his lover, but he looked as if he wished he could have nothing to do with it. He threw her an angry look. I said go. She stayed on her knees. He seemed to see all in her face, and his expression softened to a mixture of sympathy and exasperation. The feast will not be here. We will be sending over food and slaves, not you. He waved his hand impatiently. She is happy. She is beloved. You can believe your treatment is a sign of how happy she is. One makes the other. His voice rose in frustration. I don't know or care what happens between women. She clasped her hands in front of her chest. A cry stuck in her throat, but her eyes were dry. She waited intently, feeling her eyes burning into his. He treats her like a foreign princess, and he has taken no other wives. That should tell you what you want to know. Now stop looking at me like a starving tiger and get to your work. Quickly. From within, there was a sound as if the men were getting up, approaching the door. In a graceful motion, she rose to her feet and picked up the rag and bucket. She turned and walked away, her head erect. Voices echoed behind her, moving in the opposite direction. One day, Una started to enter a chamber, but was stopped by the sight of a man sitting with his back to her. She recognized him by his black hair, cut shorter than the others. It was the man with the strange eyes. Jang, who was the son of a man captured in war between Arabia and a country even farther east. He was seated on the floor with his legs folded in front of him, his hands resting in front of his navel. The stillness filled her. She felt he was engaged in some kind of prayer. Peace washed over her for a few moments, and then she turned to go. But she accidentally kicked her pail. She shot her gaze back at him, and he did turn, which she had hoped he would, and he smiled at her, and then turned back to his prayer. She left, her heart beating fast. Later, Una was scrubbing a big pot in the kitchen when Rosa came up to her. Ali wishes to speak with you. He was waiting for her in the narrow back hall. She dropped her rag into the pot and hurried, knowing Ali would not beckon for her for any casual reason. His expression was friendlier than usual, a thin, embarrassed smile below his moustache. You have a little break now, though it's foolishness. Jang wants to speak with you. Follow me. She followed him through the dark passage and upstairs to quarters she had never visited. They went through cool rooms tiled in blue to a men's sitting room with windows open to the courtyard. From outside came the sound of fountains and birds. Jang was sitting on a cushion at a low table, and another man sat to his right. Jang nodded with an encouraging smile. The other man, an official in an elaborately embroidered robe, spoke. Jang is interested in your foreign land. He wants you to tell him about your gods and your inferior beliefs. I will translate if necessary. Tell us what you believe. Una looked from one to the other. Ali stood in the corner and folded his arms. There was a twinkle in his eye, as if he were expecting a fine joke. She opened her mouth to speak, after a long pause. Her voice was clear, but quiet. Flute-like. Her words sounded like a very old song, sung in deserts at sunset. 
I could tell you what my people believe. It is that a loving God sent his only Son to redeem mankind, sacrificing himself for the sins of the world. I believe this story to be beautiful, but it is all strange to me now. You ask what I believe. I believe that nothing happens for a reason. There is no order and no procession of events lead into any glorious ending. The world has become what it is, but it all just as easily could have been completely different. One truth is the same as any other, because such truths float above the world like stars. They do not really touch this world. I do not look up at them. The world could just as easily have been something completely different from what it is. But now, it is what it is, and we are trapped in the box it has become. Her voice ended in a hush, and she looked steadily at Jang. Jang's eyes filled with tears, and he bowed his head. She didn't look at the other men in the room. In a moment, Ali grabbed her arm and pushed her back out of the room and towards the stairs. She hurried back to the kitchen. Her pot was where she had left it. To be continued. If you enjoy Continuous Dream, please give us a five-star rating on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player. For other ways to support the show, please see the show notes or visit www.continuousdream.com. Thanks for listening.